So we'll see how to apply the, the principle of conservation of uh, angular momentum. So uh, there's the principle of conservation of linear momentum, which says that the linear momentum uh, at the instance one equals the linear momentum at the instance two. Uh, and this is only true if the, this is true only if the linear impulse Called it linear external impulse or impulses are zero. Sum of so if the sum of all external impulses to the system are zero, then the linear momentum is conserved. So if an example would be uh, this is the example which we did, this was an exam, like a bullet penetrating, uh, if you have two, uh, two, two bodies uh, colliding against each, when they collide, the sum of the impulses of that complete system is zero. So I know that the system one or body one is providing an impulse on body two and vice versa, but since those impulses are equal and opposite, the sum of the impulses are zero. And so when the sum is zero, we can say that the linear momentum is conserved. So analogous to the linear momentum conservation, there is something called angular uh, principle of conservation of angular momentum, which is simply the angular momentum at instance one equals the angular momentum at instance two. And this is true only if the sum of all angular impulses on a system are zero. So the sum is zero. So you could you could have a case where the linear momentum is uh, is not conserved, but the angular momentum is conserved. Okay, it can happen when the force is such uh, when you have a force, but the the moment arm to the force is is zero. You could have, you could get that case. So you got to be careful when you apply the principle. Just don't blindly apply angular momentum and linear momentum blindly. You got to see if uh, those facts are true. Sum of internal impulses of external inputs is impulses zero and sum of all uh, angular impulses on the system are zero. You've got to check those assumptions very carefully before you uh, use those principles. So one, one doesn't imply two and two doesn't imply one. You've got to be uh, judicious about how to uh, apply those. So let's see how to apply those two principles to solve a problem. Okay, so the 80 kg, 80 kg man is holding two dumbbells while standing on a turntable of negligible mass, which turns freely above the vertical axis. So it's turning this way. When his arms are fully extended, the turntable is rotating it with an angular velocity of 0.5 revolutions per second. 
determine the angular velocity of the man when he retracts his arms to the position shown so this is this is the initial position one arms extended this is position two when the arms are retracted when the arms are fully extended approximate each arm as a uniform 6 kg rod having a length of 650 mm and body of 680 kg solid cylinder of 400 mm diameter when his arms in the retracted position assume the man has a has an 80 kg solid cylinder of 450 mm diameter each dumbbell consists of two 5 kg spheres of negligible mass Okay, so a little bit about the phenomenon. Actually, this is a this is a demonstration you can do. I don't have weights, but if you, if you need a turntable with very little friction, uh, if you actually start spinning on the turntable, and you have these weights, and you are spinning at a certain speed, and then you suddenly move the weights like this, then actually it turns out that you start spinning faster because of because the angular um, angular uh, uh, because of the principle of conservation of angular momentum. Actually, I have a video I'll show how this actually happens. Let's solve the problem first, and then I'll show you the video. Uh, but this is something you can do if you have a frictionless turntable like this. This might have a little bit more friction, but it's stopping. Okay, so uh, what's happening is this person is standing with his arm fully extended. Like this. This is position one. Let's try to see uh, how the how we can approximate his geometry. Uh, it's given that each arm has a 6 kg cylinder of 650 mm length. So this thing is 0.65 and mass of 6 kg, 6 kg. And his body is a 68 kilogram solid of diameter 400 mm. So the radius here is going to be half of the diameter, which is 0.2 meters. Okay, so that's position one. In position two, So arm retracted, the man is a 80 kg cylinder like this of 450 mm diameter. So the radius is 0.225, half of 450. Uh, and each dumbbell consists of Okay, so when he's retracted, the dumbbell is right here. That's the dumbbell. I forgot to draw it over here. So that is, so each, each dumbbell consists of two of those spheres, and each sphere is five kilograms. So the weight of each dumbbell is 10 kilograms. Right, 10 kgs, 10 kgs. So this is position two. Okay, so uh, the system has, if you consider the system with the man in the turntable now, uh, it's not given there, but the turntable is assumed to be massless. Otherwise, you'd have to factor in the angular momentum of the turntable. But this system consisting of the person and the turntable is, is a complete system with the, the net external angular impulse is equal to zero because uh, because there is no, well, it's a complete system, so there's no external forces really acting on it. Okay, there are no forces, so there is no, there's no momentum. Uh, there's no uh, external impulses, there's no external angular impulses. So we can use the principle of either of those principles. Uh, since we are asked to find the velocity after he retracts his hands, uh, so angular velocity, we will not use the linear momentum because that gives the linear velocity. We'll use the principle of angular momentum conservation so i1 omega 1 let me write it down this way h o the axis o is going to be this so h o 
in position one is H O in position two, which is uh, I omega put that one I two omega two. Okay. Now we're given that omega one is 0.5 revolutions per second. What we asked is find omega two. Okay. Uh, we can find omega 2 provided we find what i1 and i2 is. So the way we find i1 is we got to look at this particular, uh, look at the person's geometry and find i1. Okay, so the person is approximated as uh, two cylinders, three cylinders, a, a cylinder for his body, a cylinder for his hands, and then there is a point mass which he's holding, the, the dumbbells. So we find the inertia of the person approximated as cylinders. Okay, so 68 kgs. So this is the axis. Okay, so something which we will give you is the inertia of the cylinder in that particular axis. So the inertia of the cylinder with an axis show, as shown O is actually half mass times R squared, the same as that for this. So half times mass, which is 68 kgs, times the radius square. Okay, so that's this thing. We need to find the inertia of this and this, uh, and basically if it's okay to find the inertia of one of them about axis O, and then take make it twice, right? Because it's the same uh, object about either side of the axis. So I'm going to say two times of the inertia of either of the cylinder. So let's find the inertia of the cylinder. So inertia of the cylinder, let's find the inertia. Well, the inertia tables gives you the, the inertia about the axis passing through its center of mass. The center of mass is right in the middle. Right? And the inertia about the center of mass or axis O1 is 1 12th ml squared. So 1 12th mass, which is 6 kilograms times length squared. But we don't want the, axis, the inertia of our axis O1, we want the inertia of our axis O. Right? So in order to find inertia of axis O, we need to use the parallel axis theorem. So it's inertia about O1 plus mass times the length or the distance between O and O1 squared. So mass is 6. The distance between O and O1 is this. Look at the figure. So it looks like it is uh, 0.2 plus half of 0.325. Yeah, so 0.325 to, is, uh, is the distance from here to here, this distance. But we want the inertia about this axis, so we got to add 0.2 to that. This is 0.325. This is 0 0.2. So the sum is 0.525. So it's 0.525 squared. Okay. That's the inertia of the hands or one of the hand about axis, this axis. Okay. The final thing we're left with is the inertia of the dumbbells. So uh, each of those spheres is 10 kilograms. Uh, so a point mass, the inertia of a point mass about its own axis is zero. All we need to do is to find the inertia about O. For that, we need to just take the mass and multiply it with the distance between O and uh, the position of the dumbbell. So it's 0.65 plus 0.2. This is 0.2. So it's 0.85. But since there are two dumbbells, it's going to be twice. So this is that, this is uh, a 
about x is o this is the inertia of x is o and this is the inertia of the dumbbells about x is o two of them two of them so the inertia actually if you do the math it comes out to be 19.54 kg meter square okay let's find the inertia in this position uh, so the the this particular configuration is that there is just two three three objects and then there is a mass 10 kg so the two dumbbells so the inertia about again axis o is going to be half times the mass which is now 80 kgs it's 80 because it's going to be 68 plus the weight of his arms times the radius squared so the radius is given to be 0.225 okay plus uh, the dumbbells 10 times the distance of the dumbbell from uh, the axis O so this distance let's see if you can see it from the figure I think it's uh, 0 0.3 this distance is 0.3 so 10 times 0.3 square and since there are two dumbbells it's going to be twice yes uh, each yeah so it said that each dumbbell consists of two spheres each sphere was 5 kg so it's going to be 10 So this is inertia of the person, this is the inertia of the dumbbells. So that comes out to be 3.8 uh, 3.8 to 5. Okay, so now we are all set to use the principle I1 so let's call this 1 from 1 19.54 okay so note that his inertia of the person is 19.54 when, when the arms are stretched okay when the arms are retracted like this the inertia is 3.825 so the inertia actually decreases right because the arms are not stretched anymore times omega 2 so if you solve this omega 2 is uh, you could uh, since both those sides have revolutions it's okay to keep it if, if it was more uh, if it was like half mv square half i omega square yeah i would convert it but since it's omega omega both sides it's not going to be, but you could definitely convert it. So I'm going to write my answer. If I do this, the answer comes out in revolutions. Yeah, I would worry about it only if I have a sum of two things. Like if I have velocity there, it's meters per second, and then if I take in revolutions per second, that's not going to be consistent. So I need to convert. Uh, the only thing I need to do is multiply with 2 pi, and that will convert it into uh, radians per second. So omega 2 is... Uh, 2.55 revs per second. Okay, so the interesting thing is, well, 0.5 is the initial speed when he's moving with arms stretched on this, and then when you retract the arms, you can see that the speed is 2.5, which is uh, five times. You can speed five times faster. Okay. When people do skating, ice skating, they keep doing that, and that's how they spin faster. Here's a video of showing. Uh, okay, so last uh, question before we uh, break. So the 20 kg, the 2 kg rod ACB, so 2 kg uh, supports 4 kg discs. So these are 4 kg discs. At its ends, if both discs are given a clockwise angular speed, omega a1 and omega b1 both of them are 5 radians per second while the rod is held stationary 
and then released, determine the angular velocity of the rod after both discs have sp stopped spinning relative to the rod due to frictional resistance of the pins A and B. Motion is in the horizontal plane. Neglect the friction at pin C. Okay, so the, really what the question is saying is, uh, bar A, B, C is stationary, and this two discs are spinning, and this system is then go. Uh, because those uh, discs are spinning and they are connected, uh, eventually everything will be moving at one speed. These discs, as well as the star, you're going to find that speed. No, it's not a spin joint, right? So it will speed. So it's, it's right. like if two things are connected and one thing is spinning, it will cause the other one to spin, definitely. They're spinning in, uh, I think this problem is actually the horizontal plane. Yeah, so gravity will not play, otherwise, I don't think you can. Yeah, so this is in the horizontal plane. So it's a horizontal plane. Okay, so again, if the system is considered as a whole, uh, then the net angular impulse or angular momentum, so if you want, we can draw a free power diagram like this. So there are going to be reaction forces here. HC, VC, right? Uh, there are no reaction forces here and here because I've drawn the free part diagram of the complete system, not of the individual system. Now, what I can claim is the angular impulse, angular uh, angular momentum is conserved about point C. Okay, even though there are impulses, so HC and VC are reaction forces, they are not zero, but still the angular momentum is conserved about point C. And that's because HC and VC pass through C, and so the, the net external momentum due to HC and VC is going to be zero, right? So what I can say is I1 omega 1 is I2 omega 2. Well, this comes from HC1 is HC2. Okay, so let's find uh, I1 omega 1. So this is the total momentum B4 uh, when, the, when the rod ACB is stationary. So I1 omega 1 is going to be the, okay. So there's three parts, right? There is the disk, the two disks, and then there is the rod. So I need to find the inertia I, so my bad, I should write this as summation I1 omega 1 is summation I2 omega 2, indicating that it's the sum of all the three things. So summation I1 omega 1 is going to be the inertia of the disk, which is ha half mR square. So mass is 4 times radius is 0.15 times the angular speed. So it's spinning with omega B1, so it's 5. And since it's 2, uh, discs, it's going to be twice. I2 omega 2 is the the angular momentum after the whole thing is spinning with one speed. So I need to find inertia about C. So that's going to be half times 4 times 0.15 square, but this is the inertia about this axis. So you know, find the inertia about this axis, I need to apply the parallel axis theorem, so it's going to be mass times this distance, 0.75. And since there are two disks, I need to multiply this by two. Then uh, I need to factor in the inertia of the, of the rod that's the inertia of the rod about axis C is 1 12th time mass, which is uh, 2 kilograms, times the length, which is uh, 0.75 plus 0.75, which is 1.5 square. So disks 
Discord. Uh, one sec. Yeah, so this is about access C. Yeah, it turns out it's about access C is because uh, uh, the axis of rotation of this is about B, right? And it really is not rotating about C. It's rotating about B. So this is inertia about B. This is inertia about C. So the inertia about C is actually the inertia about B because it's not rotating about C. It's rotating about B, right? This thing. It's not rotating about C. Yeah, so this is initial. Initially, only this to this suspending. Oh, okay. And finally, when it reaches an equilibrium, uh, actually B comes, B, A, C, B, sorry, the disc and the rod are all spinning at the same speed. That's why it's all this way. So if you... Uh, do summation i1 omega 1 equals summation i2 omega 2 from here. Then you get uh, omega 2 equals, so this is the only unknown. Comes out to be 0 0.096 radians per second. So again, uh, it starts off with two radians per second, this disk starts spinning, but because uh, this inertia of the complete system is more than the inertia of the two disks, you see that the angular speed has decreased. It's the same example as uh, the one with the, the dumbbells. Uh, when you increase the inertia, speed is low, decrease the inertia, speed is high. Here, uh, when it's in the initial position, the inertia is low, and when it's spinning at one speed, the inertia is high, and that's where the speed reduces. Okay, so I'm out of time, but there was uh, another question which I was supposed to do, and I just posted. So what we'll do is next time on Friday, we'll start doing a review. Uh, I would just, to, to begin with, I'll just talk about, you know, how do you go about solving problems, because now we are looking at the entire syllabus. So how do we, given a problem, how do we go about uh, choosing which concept to apply to the problem, and then we'll, we'll do problems uh, from there on. If you have any uh, regret requests, please send them via uh, Gradescope. Uh, I can try to be there at around 11, I think. I'll, I'll email you. I think I can be there. So, uh, no more what's that? No more uh, if you want to have eye clickers, I can have eye clickers. If you want to ramp up your scores, then yeah, I can have eye clickers in. Uh, my grade goes down every single time. You what? <laughs> my grade goes down every single time. Oh. I don't know why. I missed like one out of the three, and for some reason it dropped down. Like <laughs> I need a sink, so it's my. Uh, yeah. But also at the beginning, you said you would drop a few of the I clicker quizzes for the account. At the beginning, we were having all those uh, troubles. I think it's very hard for me to drop it that way because it's all comes as a sum. The only thing I can oh. do is I can probably ramp up everybody's score by some points. Uh, That's the yeah, easiest the, thing. I remember at the beginning, we were having a lot of trouble trying to everything working. Yeah, I can I can ramp it up by a few points. Yeah, I think that's what happened. But I can pick everybody's uh, score and ramp it up by, I guess, ten points or something. That that yeah.
uh, I don't think it'll affect much because 10 points right. is going to be 10 times point 0.1, yeah. so it's going to be point be an extra zero. Point. Yeah. It won't be an extra point. Well, I mean, it'll be right. a point because, uh, oh yeah, it will be a point. 10 times point 0.1 will be one point. Right? So I might do that. So it'll give you one point in your finals. Yeah, yeah, last year. And one more thing, mm -hmm. I, I did the uh, homework 11 last night, uh -huh. and with the adaptive follow-up, I got like close to 70, but on Blackboard, it showed 15. Uh, just give it some time. Okay. It takes some time to say. Right. Sit persons, let me know. All right. Thank you. Yeah.